Hello. In chapter 27, we are going to touch upon uh, human development from fertilization moving forward. And we're going to touch upon a couple of principles of inheritance. Some of this may be a review for some of you that have had genetics before, but we need to cover a little bit of it during this period of time. So let's move forward. Now, gestation and development are marked by various stages. Therefore, I have to get into some terminology here for a minute. Gestation is a time that developing embryo and fetus spend in the uterus. It's also referred to as the womb. Pregnancy is the state of the female at the time of gestation. Development is the process in which gradual anatomical and physiological changes occur from one stage to another. When we talk about prenatal development, this consists of two parts, embryonic development, hence we call the developing life, an embryo. And these are the events that occur from first, for the first tw uh, two months of the uh, life after fertilization. So basically the, from the point of fertilization for the next two months. After that point, we get fetal development which begins at the ninth week and continues until birth. Gestation consists of three integrated trimesters. So in other words, periods that are three months long. The first trimester, you have embryonic and early fetal development. During this time, all rudiments, basically the beginning structures of all major organ systems appear. Second trimester, this is the period dominated by the development of organs and organ systems. The process nears completion by the end of the sixth month. So basically, by the time we're talking about the end of the second trimester, most organ systems are complete. Third trimester, this is characterized by the largest weight gain in, in fetal weight. Most organ systems are now fully functional. Birth is really, uh, if you have a birth that occurs one to two months premature, this can have a reasonable chance of survival if, and you notice to keep putting in the words, uh, emphasis on certain words, if appropriate medical care is available. Now, postnatal development, this starts at birth and continues until maturity, which is defined as a state of full development or completed growth. So here we have, if you look at this prenatal development, and we start with embryonic development, here's the developing embryo, and it has this corona of tissue that is extending in all directions around the endometrial layer. And this is what you see by four weeks. By the time you get eight weeks, you can see that there is somewhat of a, a head or neck fold a tail fold, but basically you have a lot of the basics here, and this is at eight weeks. The heart is beating, blood is circulating. Now, when we go through fetal development, as you can see here, this is 16 weeks. In a matter of going from eight weeks to 16 weeks, um, you're now going from basically uh, to four months. You can see the amount of growth that is occurring. Now, I've mentioned this first trimester, second trimester. Uh, second trimester is interesting also because there's a change in body shape and proportions. And by the end of this trimester, the fetus looks distinctly human. Third trimester, this is the largest gain in fetal weight. Most organ systems are fully functional. And then we have, of course, the postnatal development period. Now, at fertilization, an ovum and a sperm form a zygote that prepares for cell division. Here's where you have to keep this in mind. When we're talking about uh, gametes, the sperm and the oocyte, or ovum, you have to have a fusion of these two haploid gametes. In other words, what I'm saying is this. Sperm, 23 chromosomes. Ovum, 23 chromosomes. Put them together, what do you have? Now you have 46 chromosomes. You have a fertilized egg that now has the 46 chromosomes, so we now call it really a zygote. Fertilization usually occurs between the ampulla 
and the isthmus of the uterine tube. So somewhere in that range. Usually it's one day after ovulation. So if you take a look at the fertilization steps, first thing is oocyte at ovulation. You have this ovulation. It has left uh, the ovary. It has a polar body attached to it, it being the uh, secondary oocyte. It's also surrounded by the corona retiata. Uh, the oocyte is fixed at meiosis II, the metaphase state. Now, this is important because we have not completed the second stage of meiosis yet. Next step, fertilization and oocyte activation. When we, if you remember, the sperm cells have this sort of uh, cap structure in the front of the sperm that contains enzymes. It's called the acrosome. So acrosomal enzymes from multiple sperm are going to create gaps between the cells of the corona retiata. Once a single sperm cell makes contact with the oocyte membrane and the membrane fusion occurs, the oocyte activation occurs. I'm going to get into that in a second, but it's very important because here's the question. How do we prevent from having more than just one sperm cell going inside? Once we have uh, this occurring, the secondary oocyte is now an ovum. So what happens at o oocyte activation? This is critical. You have calcium ions are released from the oocyte smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Part one, they re you have a release of enzymes that harden the zona pellucida, which is that outer cap around the ovum, and it prevents fertilization by more than one sperm. Number two, completion of meiosis II occurs and the formation of a secondary polar body gets kind of kicked out. Remember that there is unequal uh, cytokinesis. In other words, there is the ovum, and then there's this teeny weeny little polar body. The idea is to maximize the cytoplasmic material in that ovum, because it's going to be used uh, for the next succeeding uh, cleavages that occur, the cell divisions. Finally, um, you have activation of enzymes that cause a rapid increase in the ovum's metabolic rate. Now, you might ask yourself, oh, come on, it must happen once in a once in, in a while where you end up with one more sperm cell entering. So what happens? That's called trisomy, okay, or triploidy. It means that you get some development. Some cases, uh, I've read some medical papers that you get up to about the sixth month and then you have a miscarriage. Too much DNA, and we'll find this out even more so at the end of the course, uh, the end of this lecture. You can have too little and too much DNA, and that causes instability and loss of viability for the developing uh, embryo or developing uh, fetus. So as you can see here, step one, oocyte at ovulation. So. We're still stuck here, but notice also in that first division of meiotic division, you ended up with the first polar body. Here is most of the ovum, okay? At the time, we still call it a secondary oocyte. We go to set, step two, fertilization, oocyte activation. Uh, to trigger the oocyte activation, you have to have one of the sperm cells come in, and as it does, as it fuses and, uh, with the membrane, you start having this release of calcium, which acts in several different ways. One, you're going to have a second meiotic cleavage, and that's where we're accounting for that secondary polar body. But the other thing that you're going to have is that the zona uh, pellucida gets very, very much more separation there and um, creates a barrier so that other sperm cells could not enter. So let's go to the next fertilization step. This is where we have the pronuclei develop and DNA synthesis occurs. Now, sperm is absorbed into the cytoplasm. Remember that the sperm head is the only structure that really contains DNA. The female nuclear materials are going to reorganize as the female pronucleus. The male pronucleus is going to develop as the rest of the sperm is breaking down. Then you get into the spindle formation beginning. It sounds a little bit like mitosis, and in a way, 
it is. The male and female pronuclei chromatin are going to condense into chromosomes and the spindle fibers are going to appear. This is the start of the process of cleavage. So just as soon as you get into fertilization, you're going to start moving into cleavage. When I talk about cleavage, this is the first uh, mitotic division to make from that original ovum, that fertilized ovum, that zygote. You're going to make um, what they call daughter cells, okay? But the process is reductive in the sense of the cytoplasm left behind. In other words, you had this big, large, fertilized ovum, and then you have two smaller daughter cells, and then they're going to divide again with cleavage, and they're going to make four but smaller cells. In essence, once fertilization occurs, you don't really have a lot of time to build up more of the material inside. Everything that you started off with inside of the ovum, uh, in the sense of proteins and, and, and uh, glucose and all the other materials inside that cytoplasm, you're just going to start dividing and dividing and dividing into smaller cell parts. Smaller cells, I should say, exactly. Here, the pronuclei develop, the DNA synthesis occurs. Here, you're going to have the pronucleus of the fertilizing sperm. It's going to form the male pronucleus. You have the female pronucleus here. And then you're going to start having the spindle formations here. As you have these pronuclei, they are going to condense and make chromosomes. Okay? You're going to start getting ready for a cleavage. As you increase the number of cleavages, you're going to get smaller and smaller daughter cells. Fertilization step five, amphimixis occurs. What is that? That's the fusion process of the pronuclei chromosomes. You're going to have male and female pronuclei basically fused together. That's amphifixis. Excuse me, amphimixis. Now the cell in essence, is a fertilized zygote. It's got 46 chromosomes, and fertilization is now complete. But as soon as we finish the fertilization, we're going right into cleavage. The cell is now going to prepare to divide. Okay? This is referred to, as the cell prepares to divide, this is considered the moment of conception. You have the maternal from mom, the paternal from dad, chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate. First cleavage forms two blastomeres. Now, once you had the first cleavage division, this is going to come uh, near completion after about 30 hours post-fertilization. Two daughter cells are formed, each one half the size of the original zygote. These cell cells are referred to as blastomeres, and you can see this. Empty mixes here. You're going to have all the chromosomes mixing together and lining up, going to be attached by the spindle fibers here and here. Okay? Now, we've got 46 chromosomes here. We have a zygote. Okay? Moment of conception has occurred. Now, let's look here. First cleavage forms two blastomeres. As you begin having the, uh, what we would call anaphase, the pulling apart of the chromosomes toward each of the spindle fiber centromeres here. You haven't even formed a nuclear uh, uh, envelope yet, but you've already started doing the separation. You can see the pinching in here. Okay. This is what you see if you looked at a uh, basically the lot, the many, many, many sperm cells in this huge ovum or secondary oocyte. By the way, there's a little trick here just to keep you in mind. The largest cell in, in the human body is the ovum. The smallest cell in the human body is the sperm cell. So you can see this as lots of sperm cells are being drawn to swim toward and begin the penetration process of that secondary oocyte. Now, cleavage is going to continue until the blastocyte implants into the uterine wall. So every time you have a, 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 a cleavage, you are going to get instead two, then four, then eight, then 16. And each time the cells are going to get smaller and smaller. 
when we consider something a pre-embryo, this is a group of blastomeres created by the cleavage divisions. Cleavage as a process lasts about seven days. After three days, the embryo is literally a solid ball of cells. It's called a morula, sort of like, a, looks like a little berry. This morula will reach the uterus on day four. Now, up to the point of about day five, what's holding together all of these cells so they don't kind of like drift off or detach, whatever, the zona pellucida, okay? It's holding everything together. Until about day five, day five, you start having the zona uh, allow cell exposure to uterine fluids and nutrients. The zona will eventually disintegrate. Um, days five and six, blastomeres start form, uh, forming what's called a blastocyst. So, excuse me, blastomeres form the blastocyst. So in essence, the blastomeres are going to have this inner cavity. It's called the blastocele. So it's going to look like more a hollow ball of cells. This is also an interesting thing that the blastomeres no longer are the same size or same shape. Some are larger, some are smaller. Okay. They have different what they call fates. In other words, the future progress of where they are going to be part of uh, building different parts of the, the formation of that embryo, limbs, organs, etc. During days six through nine, you have implantation into the uterine wall. Now, at day six, the uterine cavity contains glycogen-rich secretions of the uterine glands. If you remember what glycogen is, that's basically a polysaccharide. Lots of glucoses that are attached together by a glycosidic bond. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because what I'm saying is the uterine cavity is already beginning to release from its uterine glands secretions that are going to provide the energy for the cell or I should say for the zygote, the embryo. There we go, the right term, the embryo. The rate of cell growth and division is going to increase and the blastocyst will enlarge. Here's our first cleavage division. Now we have blastomeres, two cell stage, four cell stage. Notice that we're having this reduction here and each of the cells gets somewhat smaller. Eventually we get to the early morula, we have the advanced morula, many, many more cells still being contained by the zona pellucida. Eventually, by about day five, we lose the zona pellucida and we start having this transport to the uterus. Now, if you notice there, we've gotten a blastocele here, but even more so, there's this inner uh, patch of cells. These are going to be the inner cell mass that's going to lead to the development of the actual embryo. Six through nine days, you have implantation in the uterine wall. By day 10, you have st starting the formation of this small extra embryonic membrane called the yolk sac. But let's go back a bit. Day seven, we have implantation. Cleavage will end once the blastocyst contacts the uterine lining, the endometrium. Okay. The implantation occurs as the blastocyst erodes the endometrial lining and becomes enclosed within the endometrium by day 10. So it's sort of like it, it kind of uh, enzymatically implants itself. The implantation is referred to as nidation, nidation. The blastocyst will consist of the trophoblast, which is a cell layer surrounding the blastocyst. These cells will later nourish the embryo and later form part of the placenta. These cells will also produce human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. That's a really critical hormone that you need to know. Hint, hint. This is the hormone that is detected for pregnancy tests. Here, what we have are simple tests. They can show up in the blood. They can show up in the urine. But this hormone is basically keeping and sustaining the uterine lining because it's going to tell the ovaries and it's going to uh, initiate certain biochemical changes, uh, telling the ovaries to continue to, to make, through uh, the corpus luteum, progesterone. It will also maintain certain levels of estrogen. It sort of begins to take over the process, but it is extremely important. Now, the inner cell mass. This is the cell layer 
located on one side of the blastocyst, but it's on the inside. And this is going to, as I said, form the embryo later. Day 10, trophoblast development. Trophoblast cells divide and specialize to the, cytotro proto the cytotrophoblast, which is the inner cell layer of the trophoblast, next to the inner cell mass. Syncytiotrophoblast, which is the result of the fusion of the trophoblast cells near the uterine walls, and they end up forming this multinucleated syncytial layer. Think about it this way. It's like cells, they kind of, instead of destroy one another, they fuse all together. And so you have this larger mass that has multiple nuclei. It's as if the cells all blend together. And that's exactly what's going on. Now, day nine, formation of the amniotic cavity. The syncytotrophoblast enlarges, erodes surrounding endometrium. Nutrients from the eroding uteri, excuse me, uterine glands are absorbed by the syncytotrophoblast cells. These nutrients will provide energy for the early embryo formation. Now, there are specific structures called villi. These are finger-like extensions from the trophoblast that extend outward into the surrounding endometrium and grow around endometrial capillaries. Yes, this is moving closer and closer to the formation of a placenta, but we've got still a while to go. Now, the capillary walls are destroyed and maternal blood percolates through the trophoblastic channels called lacunae. The inner cell mass separates from the trophoblast side and a fluid-filled chamber, the amniotic cavity, is formed. Here you see the blastocyst. Here you see the uterine glands. Okay, and these are presumed to be blood vessels, endometrial capillaries, actually. Day six, blastocyst. Day seven, implantation. Here is the inner cell mass. Here is the outer layer, which is called the trophoblast. As we start having contact, we start forming two differentiations of the trophoblast cells here, the cytotrophoblast and the syncytotrophoblastic. This is, in essence, the fusion of different cells together, making multinucleated, larger, uh, you might want to call it a supercell mass. By the time we get from day eight, which is the trophoblast development, to the day nine, the formation of the amniotic cavity, what do you see? Well, you start seeing these extensions of this syncytotrophoblast, and what it starts doing is wrapping around some of the uterine uh, endometrial capillaries. You also see the breakdown of these capillary blood cells, so they basically have blood going around throughout the uh, lacunae. You will also see this formation of a space. Here's the inner cell. Here is the amniotic, the amniotic cavity is right here. Remember that you still have the blastocele here. This outer layer here is the still trophoblastic cells. Why is this going on? Because you have to set up certain early stages to eventually have successful formation of things like the amniotic cavity, the yolk sac, and other structures that are referred to as extra embryonic membranes. Now, gastrulation produces three germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. If you remember that lab handout I gave you, yes, you need to review that, okay? That would be helpful for you because what we're really talking about is several different germ lines or basic layers of cells that are going to eventually form nerves, blood, bone, muscle, um, the innermost parts like the digestive lining, etc. All of these have pre-programmed. So they differentiate and they have this pre-programming and then they will have further uh, cell signals or uh, basically genes turned on that will eventually allow them to develop further. Now, let's just continue with the formation of the amniotic cavity. Cells of the inner cell mass are organized into this oval sheet known as a blastodisc. The blastodisc layers, the superficial layer facing the amniotic cavity, later at the amnion, 
this is going to be the first extra embryonic membrane. The deeper layers exposed to the fluid of the blastocele, this is where the blastodisc is made up, day 10, the yolk sac is forming. Now, you might sit there and say, yolk sac, but I'm not a bird. That's true. But through evolution, we have carried on certain specific structures. Yolk sac does not really produce yolks because we're really not laid as eggs. If you were a bird, you'd be laid as an egg and you would have nutrients in that yolk sac. In sac. Instead, we have that as the basic uh, precursor that's going to provide early blood cell development for what will be later on called the fetus. Okay? So, yolk sac formation, you have deep layers of the inner cell mass. They migrate to outer edges of the blastocele, and this is the first step in the formation of the yolk sac. That's your second extra embryonic membrane. And you can see this formation here. Here's our blastocele. Here's our amnionic cavity here. The amnion membrane is going to be coming out through here. Cytotrophoblast is all throughout here. Syncytioblast, cyto, syncytial cytoblast is all around here. And so we have the blastodisc layers here and here. Now, Yolk sac formation, what's going on? The syncytiotrophoblast cells, where are they? They're all starting around. But notice what has happened. We've moved inward, going into the layers of the endometrium. We're now completely surrounded by endometrium. But some of these cells are going to eventually form the yolk sac. Um, just to note, here you have also the cytotrophoblast here. This is still the inner cell mass, but has different uh, fates. Now, we've gone from day 10, it's interesting, and we're going to jump ahead to day 15. Now, there's an importance to this. This importance is that this is where we get into cell migration process, gastrulation. This is going to produce the oval three-layered sheet called the embryonic disc. We've gone from somewhat this early disc to much more sophistication. This disc is going to form the body of the embryo. All other cells of blastocysts form extra embryonic membranes. Superficial cells of the blastodisc migrate toward the central line. This is known as the primitive streak. Migrating cells move and create three distinct embryonic germ layers. This is what I want you to do also. If you go to page 1043, you'll see this vast table of the fates of germ layers. Take time to review them. I don't expect you to memorize everything, so I'm going to give you some heads up on that. But there are some basic structures you need to be aware of. When we talk about ecto, meso, and endo, remember those prefixes tell you where they are. Ecto is the outermost body structures. Meso is going to lead to the middlemost body structures. Endo will lead to the innermost body structures. Now, you have to be also aware that not everything is absolutely perfect. Why? Because we find out in studying development in embryology that some cells during a period of time of development migrate and migrate quite a distance. If you remember your endocrinology, you have this wonderful gland called the adrenal gland. Its outer layers, the cortex, make steroidal hormones, but they actually come from mesodermal uh, cells. But when you get into the medulla, what did I say? The medulla is really making uh, neurotransmitters. We call them hormones, but they really have a, a destiny that, that could be taken as neural because you're having epinephrine, norepinephrine that's being secreted by the medulla. Turns out that interestingly enough, the medulla's fate or germ layer comes from cells that migrated from the ectodermal. Ectodermal to help you, you're going to see a lot of this. Ectodermal is sort of neural in its, uh, can, some of them can make neural derivatives, in other words, spinal cord, brain, things like that. So this is where we get some very interesting uh, development structures. Now, here is this we have the amnion here. We have the primitive streak here. We have the blastodisc. 
The outermost layer is ectodermal. The middle part is going through development, and you're going to have these mesodermal cells. There is going to be a seal, a sort of a pocket in here. If you think about it, we have one. It's called the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then on the innermost layer, there's the endoderm. <sighs> okay, so this is all the embryonic disc. Here, ectodermal contributions. You will see a large amount of it. All of the nervous system, including brain and spinal cord. Endocrine, some of the pituitary gland, adrenal medulla. Uh, respiratory, you will see some of the other structures here, both digestive and integment. The integment is really coming from um, the uh, ectodermal. But the interesting thing is that is for the epidermis. The dermis comes from mesoderm. And in mesoderm contributes the skeletal structures, the muscular structures, all the structures of the cardiovascular and lymphatic, the urinary ones, and a few others. But I want you to be aware of these. Endodermal, this is interesting because that's where you start getting the thymus, thyroid, and pancreas glands. You get some of the mucus epithelium, except in the mouth and the anus. You get the respiratory epithelium, except in the nasal passageways. Uh, you will get the urinary bladder and distal portions of the duct system, as well as some of the distal portions of the duct system stem cells that will eventually produce the gametes. Okay, so ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal. Now, extra embryonic membranes form the placenta that supports fetal growth and development. There are four, and yes, you need to know extra embryonic membranes that form and are combinations of various germ layers. The yolk sac is a combination of endodermal and mesoderm. It's an important site for blood cell formation. The amnion is ectoderm and mesoderm. These form the amniotic fluid for cushioning and thermal regulation of developing embryo and fetus. The allantosis is, is composed of ectoderm and mesoderm. It extends partway into the umbilical stalk and is the base of the allantosis, uh, which forms part of the urinary bladder. So I should say the base of the allantosis for, forms the urinary bladder. The last one is the chorion, which is part mesoderm, part cytotrophoblast. This forms part of the fetal portion of the placenta. Sorry about this. And you can see some of these formations here. These cells will be the amnion. The amniotic fluid here, the completed yolk sac is down here, the chorion. Now, let's start going into a couple of other important areas. The placenta forms, in essence, the interface between embryonic, fetal, and maternal systems. Okay? It's the site of exchange for nutrients, gases, wastes, etc and develops as villi of the chorion invade the endometrium and break down maternal blood vessels. Okay. Now, as you see here, here is the formation of this placenta. Now, I'm going to also throw out to you a couple of other points not covered in the book. When they talk about high-risk pregnancies, one of the issues that does show up is if this placenta is down here, near the throat or near near the ending or the opening the internal os of the cervix and that's very very risky pregnancy sometimes this is where the woman is told bed rest all the rest of the pregnancy in hopes of keeping the uh maintaining the, the fetal development etc one other situation will be if the formation of everything is not in this basic uh, dome or in the walls, but maybe almost at the opening, almost into the tube. And that's where you have a tubular pregnancy. And when that happens, of course, it eventually will either rupture the tube and you have loss of the pregnancy as well, uh, or it will be deemed a risk and then it will have to be removed, both tube and developing uh, embryo. As you can see here, what you've got by this point is a yolk sac. Notice it's very small because it's not really that essential for providing nutrients. It's there to provide blood cells, okay? You have 
the uterine cavity and you have the formation of the blastocele, you will eventually have the formation of other structures with these extra embryonic membranes. Now, the, the formation of extra embryonic membranes is associated with major changes in the shape and complexity of the embryo. When we get to week two, we have migration of mesodermal cells around the inner surface of the cytotrophoblast, and that forms the chorion, which I've mentioned. Uh, the mesoderm migration around the outside of the amniotic cavity uh, between the ectodermal cells and the cytotrophoblast forms the amnion. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is where these are coming from and where, what do they do and why is this so important? Mesodermal cells, uh, you will have also having migration around the endodermal pouch, which forms the yolk sac. Okay, we've already dealt with that in week two, but week three, we have the embryonic cell bulges into the amniotic cavity at the head fold. Now, what happens is it's not as if you have a straight like an arrow standing up straight formation. The embryo gets to, to curve its head forward a bit and eventually a tail forward. And this will eventually later on, when the child starts developing, become much straighter. We know that we have a, a curvature of the spine that exists, but that shows up later on too. What we have to keep in mind is that the mesoderm is extending, excuse me, extending along the core of each trophoblastic villus forming chorionic villi. This is in contact with maternal tissues. Embryonic blood vessels develop within each of the villi. So you see here, you've got the amnion, the yolk sac, you've got the blastocele, and you have the various structures around here. But notice that mesoderm's been migrating around in here. Later on, what that leads to is the formation of the chorionic villi. Furthermore, you will notice that you have the allantosis is here, the amniotic cavity with the fluid, and the head fold is occurring right here. This is the primary disc, and you're having that head which will fold. Okay? Week four, the embryo now has a tail fold as well as a head fold. Now, body axes, this is where they get fixed. They're not established. You have anterior, posterior, left and right, superior, inferior. The body stalk, this is a connection between the embryo and the chorion has been now established. The yolk stalk, that's a connection between the endoderm of the embryo and the yolk sac has been established. The maternal blood moves through complex lacunae linked or lined with syncytiotrophoblasts. Okay. Week five, developing embryo and extra embryonic membranes uh, will lead to bulges in the uterine cavity. The embryo moves away from the placenta. The body stalk and yolk stalk fuse to form what we call the umbilical stalk, which will be eventually the umbilical cord. By week 10, the fetus is connected to the placenta by an elongated umbilical cord. And that's composed of parts of the yolk stalk, blood vessels, and allantosis. Also, you'll notice a mucus plug forming. Now, it forms down in the os at the cervix to prevent bacteria from entering the uterus. Here you see at week four the various stalks, body stalk, yolk stalk, yolk sac, head fold here, and now you've got the tail fold. This space in here is actually the embryonic gut. What we have if we go to week five is the umbilical stalk is beginning to form right in through here. Based in part on the yolk stalk, you will have the placenta forming very nicely here. You have the uh, chorionic villi here in the placenta. Now, when you get to week 10, Look at what expansion has occurred. The amnion is expanded to fill the entire uterine cavity. Okay, so you're taking up a lot more space. The fetus is connected to, uh, to the placenta by an elongated umbilical cord. We're going to talk about the umbilical cord in a few minutes also. Here is the placenta, and here is the exchange that's occurring here. Okay, you have the amnion, the chorion, 
Oh, yes, and let's not forget about that mucus plug right through there. Okay. Now, the placenta performs many vital functions during prenatal development. Blood flowing through paired umbilical arteries. Now, by the way, you're going to note this, and I mentioned this before, in um, the blood vessel system. When you are born, they check the umbilical veins and arteries. They should be two umbilical arteries, one umbilical vein. That's it, two to one. And yes, I've had that on, on a review question, so you want to keep that in mind. It is critical. If they see anything other than a two to one, then they start looking for other uh, situations because other than two to one indicates that there's some developmental um, problem that has occurred that is probably going to lead to uh, or, or it will endanger the newborn and it may need or necessitate surgery to correct the problem. Keep in mind that when we have this exchange of the placenta, we're having a gas exchange, a waste exchange, a nutrient exchange. The umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood and nutrients toward the fetus. So mom is breathing for the fetus. Mom is uh, carrying nutrients to the fetus and taking away waste, etc. Got to keep that in mind. Also, when we get up to this development, look at the complexity here of the chorionic villi. You have an area here that is filled with maternal blood. Okay? And this is blood that's leaked out through maternal blood vessels, and it's taken away by maternal veins. But what happens here in this exchange is that basically um, you have, now this is a reversal. Everybody gets this mistaken, okay? Remember that oxygenated is going to be represented by red. Deoxygenated is going to be represented by blue. But when we have arteries going into a certain or, or delivering blood to a certain structure here, normally you would call them arteries. They'd be associated with red. That's not so here because the fetus is dependent on mom for lungs, for kidneys, and for nutrients in the blood. So deoxygenated blood comes up through umbilical arteries and oxygenated blood leaves via umbilical vein, singular vein, okay? And you can see the chorionic villi in a cross section here. This is the embryonic connective tissue. This is the fetal blood vessels. And this is the sensitio uh, trophoblastic cells. The materia, area filled with maternal blood is right here. Okay? So this is just a simple chorionic villus. The next thing that we're going to talk about are the placental hormones because the placenta uh, becomes key by about eight to 10 weeks. Everything is taken over by the placenta. So when we think about uh, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, it gets sort of hijacked. When the placenta is in, enrolled, it does several things. One, it's going to make human chorionic gonadotropin. So that role will basically be handed over from just the trophoblastic cells to now the placenta. HCG is, we've talked about this, this is absolutely essential. It's, it's going to show up in mom's blood and spell out mom's urine. That's where you get the uh, pregnancy tests, okay? It maintains the corpus luteum for progesterone production and maintains the uterine lining. After three to four months, the placenta is secreting also progesterone. Human placental lactogen. Now, this prepares the mammary glands for milk production. Placental prolactin. Placental, this is a placental hormone that's similar to the maternal hormone prolactin. The mammary glands require HPL, estrogens, progesterone, growth hormone, prolactin, and thyroid hormones for a full conversion from a, sort of a prep tissue to fully prepared milk producing cells in the breasts. There's another hormone that's very interesting. It's called relaxin. 
Now, this is a peptide hormone that's secreted by the corpus luteum and the placenta during pregnancy. This is increasing the flexibility of the pubic syphilis, causes the cervix to dilate. Now, let me just help you a couple of points. What it's doing is it's acting on certain cartilage, such as what you'd find in the pubic syphilis. And so you're going to find that certain ligaments and certain cartilage areas are going to be much more flexible. Uh, one case is that when women start getting into later months of their pregnancy and they start getting flat feet, it is because as the pregnancy is continuing and the relaxin is working on the ligaments in the feet, the weight and the added weight of, of course, the developing fetus is going to cause the arches to flat to collapse because they're going to stretch out the ligaments. And so you're going to lose the various types of um, arches that occur in the foot. Gets very hard for some women uh, with their feet. Sometimes I knew one woman that what she just basically did was wear flip-flops for the rest of the uh, pregnancy. We're going to talk in the last two months. Finally, in the placental hormones, we have to bring up progesterone and estrogen. After the first trimester, placenta produces uh, sufficient progesterone to continue throughout the pregnancy. Estrogen, uh, the placenta levels increase toward the end of the third trimester. The rising estrogen levels play a role in stimulating labor and delivery. And as you can see this demonstrated in this chart, this is helpful for you in reviewing. Organ systems form in the first trimester, become completely functional it depends on the individual organ, but a lot of them become functional in the second and third trimesters. There are a few, of course, developmental uh, limits. For example, the lungs. You're not going to get lungs making in the alveoli um, the surfactant. Usually what happens is that mom's adrenal uh, cortex will produce cortisol in the latter months, just before pregnancy. Now, if you have a preemie, what happens? Well, doctors try to take care of the mom and the baby, and what happens is before they have the delivery, if let's say the water is broke, she's two months pre premature or three months premature, what they'll try to do is give injections to mom before the delivery of cortisol, and then afterwards for the baby, with the hope that they can uh, trigger the cells to start producing the surfactant. Otherwise, it's a struggle. I discussed this before in the respiratory chapter. So let's continue as we talk about this. Uh, we're going to talk about the neural plate. After three weeks, there's a thick ectodermal band that forms along the posterior midline. There are somites. These are mesodermal blocks that form uh, right next to the uh, neural plate on each side. And what they basically will do is differentiate into dermis, skeletal muscle, cartilage, tendons, and vertebrae. Okay. And you can see them right here. These are the somites here. You're going to get these neural folds and they fuse to enclose. When they these two areas, these thickened areas uh, fuse together, you're going to get basically what is going to be the brain ventricles here, the central canal of the spinal cord. The central canal of the future spinal cord will also close up eventually on here. Uh, this is a cut wall of the amnion. This is going to be the future head of the embryo. Of course, as you can see here by development, and we have the beginning of buds, arm bud, excuse me, arm buds here, leg buds here. Now you notice this darkened area here? This is the formation of the actual eye. This, of course, is the front of the head. This is the forebrain is going to be up here. And of course, you have also the tail down here and what we call the body stalk here. If you move now to a later part of development, this is by about six weeks. You have an amnion. You have a well-developed structure of the placenta. And you can see also the chorionic villi over here. And you can see the arms eye, developing brain, the eventual formation of the ear, legs here, and you can see the umbilical cord. We go to the next level, which is the end of the first trimester. You have 
the amnion, the umbilical cords, passing blood along very nicely. You can see ribs here. You can see also the darkened area, which would be the heart, the ear, the eye, the nose, and the mouth, as well as the fingers and the toes. We move to basically four months gestation. This is a fiber optic image. And what you have here is uh, the developing fetus. You can see eyes, nose, mouth, the uh, phthrum, um, uh, fingers. You can even see fingernails here. This is how good this imagery is. And uh, basically, you go from there. This is what they refer to. I was talking with an ultrasonographer. Uh, it's called 4D ultrasonography. You can see the nose. You can see the philtrum there. You can see the mouth and some of the fingers. This is um, the ultrasound at about six months of gestation. Okay, let's just bring into one other point that's brought up. Multiple births, twins, triplets, quadruplets. This will occur via nature or due to fertility drugs and assisted reproductive technology, otherwise known as test tube embryos. Okay, let me explain to you. We'll, we'll take first nature uh, first. There is a rule called the rule of 86. Now this is without fertility drugs, without assisted reproductive technology. Rule of 86, in nature, one out of 86 births is twins. If you take 86 and square it, one out of the 86 squared will be triplets. One out of 86 cubed, okay, that's 86 to the third power, will be quadruplets or four. Okay, and you can keep going that way. Now, nature has been completely corrupted by the use of fertility drugs, which many times will cause women to uh, ovulate multiple uh, secondary oocytes at the same time. Also, assisted reproductive technology. Many times what happens is that instead of putting one fertilized um, embryo into the woman, a lot of these assisted reproductive technologies will put in several. So with hopes that at least one will implant. Now, this means that some cases two develop or three develop. But if they were each individually fertilized by a uh, different sperm cell, etc., they are fraternal, not identical. What does that mean? Fraternal, these are dizygotic twins, twins that develop when two separate oocytes are ovulated and fertilized. Identical means monozygotic twins. What happens here is usually either a separation of the blastomeres early in cleavage or the inner cell mass splits prior to gastulation. This is when you have, they are identical. They have same DNA, etc. And with dizygotic, that's not going to be the, the situation. Okay? I hope that clarifies things. And here you have two happy babies here. Okay. Let's start dealing with the pregnancy in the sense of, how does this affect mom? Pregnancy places anatomical and physiological stresses on maternal systems. Yeah. You got to remember, and if you've listened to anybody or know anybody that's, you know, gone through pregnancy and all that stuff, family members or whatever, the woman will say, I'm peeing for two. I'm eating for two. I am uh, breathing for two. Okay. The developing embryo or fetus is totally dependent on the maternal digestive, urinary, respiratory, circulatory system. Okay. Space considerations. Observe the difference between non-pregnant and full-term pregnancy in the sense of the images that I'm going to show you next. What happens is that the space in the abdominal pelvic cavity gets greatly reduced due to the presence of this continually growing fetus. Many maternal organs may actually push out of place due to the developing fetus. I do want you to review the last chart, which I'll show you, and this is all the different things that occur to a woman uh, at the end of the third trimester. So let's go through this. Here we have this nice, happy lady who's pregnant and much further down the road. 
Notice if we have a non-pregnant female, here is where the uterus is. Here is where the bladder is. Here is where the rectum is. And then you have the various parts of the small intestine and large intestine that are attached to the various mesenteries, etc. Stomach's up here, liver's up here. Now, full-term infant. Notice that you have the massive taking up of lots and lots of space inside by both the fetus and this over-expanded uterus. Now, what you also notice is that the head of the, the baby, if it's right there, a lot of times they'll be sitting there and saying, the baby is sitting on my bladder, and that is why I have to go, and everybody understands that. Also notice that you have the compression of many of the small intestine as well as the transverse colon, uh, decreased space in the stomach, etc. Now, uh, we have, of course, the placenta. We have, of course, the umbilical cord. To help you to understand this, there's several other th uh, thoughts that come to mind. One of them people will talk about is morning sickness. And several researchers have asked these questions. Why is it that a woman with a developing baby would basically say, I feel sick in the morning? Okay. I remember one Harvard public health expert uh, researcher, what she did was she looked at the levels of estrogen and progesterone. One of the things that happens is that these hormones will slow down the, gas, the gastric and intestinal motility of food products. Now, there's an advantage here, too, because that makes sure that the developing mother absorbs the maximum amount of nutrients. But that means also that you're going to have gastric emptying slowing down much, much uh, more than normal, as well as intestinal uh, motility being decreased. And so a lot of times, the woman wakes up the next morning, it's almost like she's got still some of her last meal the night before still in the stomach. Uh, there is another theory by Marjorie Profit that was dealing with uh, some of the concepts where with uh, the developing embryo, morning sickness is part of the response to defend against very small amounts of toxins that might be in normal food, but at the very small amounts that are there, they don't affect mom. They would affect a developing embryo. And so there's a greater sensitivity to certain things. You know, it may be some of the material in coffee or in spicy food or something else like that. Okay, now that we've moved through that, let's take a look here. Here's what you have to look at with a uh, pregnant woman. Uh, you have, of course, mammary glands that are developing, and they're fully developed by the sixth month of pregnancy. You're having a greater amount of weight put up against the uh, kidneys, as well as the maternal glomerular filtration rate is increasing by nearly 50%, okay? Because of the volume of urine uh, produced increases and the weight of the, the uterus presses down in the urinary bladder. A lot of times pregnant women need to urinate frequently. Then we have gas exchange. Maternal respiratory rate and tidal volume will increase. The maternal blood volume increases by almost 50% by the end of gestation. This will also add to an increase that contributes. The blood volume will contribute to an increase in GFR. Now, Maternal requirements for nutrients increase by up to 30% above normal. And then we have the uterine expansion, okay? So, let's move forward. Multiple factors are going to initiate and accelerate labor and delivery. As the fetus increases in size, the stretching of the uterus smooth muscles does not lead to responsive uterine contractions. Uh, this is due to the progesterone. Now, the progesterone is going to sort of inhibit the contractions. Progesterone is made from the placenta. It's going to sort of blunt it down. But late in pregnancy, some women are going to experience occasional spasms of contractions. These are referred to as Braxton Hicks contractions. They're referred to as false labor. True labor is going to involve both placental and fetal factors. 
What do I mean by that? Okay, now, before you look at this chart and go completely bonkers, uh, because you sit there and say, do I got to memorize every little fact here? Think about this. What are the placental factors? Well, you've got estrogens. They're going to increase the sensitivity of smooth muscle cells. They're going to make contractions more likely. As you get closer and closer to delivery, production of estrogens goes up. Per estrogens will also increase the smooth muscle sensitivity to oxytocin. Now, let's go over to relaxin. That's produced by the placenta, relaxes the pelvic articulations, dilates the cervix. Fetal factors. Growth and increase of the fetal weight is going to stretch the myometrium. The fetal pituitary gland is going to release oxytocin in response to estrogens. Now, this is going to increase the excitability, if you want to say the irritability, of the myometrium, because now you've got this production of prostaglandins, oxytocin. The maternal oxytocin is going to be released. This is going to be stimulated by high estrogen levels. The cervix is stretching. Estrogen oxytocin will stimulate the production of prostaglandins in the endometrium. So you've got a one-two punch here, and it's going to lead to more excitability on the myometrium. This is going to start some of the labor contractions, but the labor contractions move the fetus and stretch the myometrium. The stretching stimulates additional, this is another one of those positive feedbacks we talked about in a and P1. Okay, one of the few. As you have the stretching, it's going to stimulate more oxytocin prostaglandin release. So you're going to have even more stretching back and forth, back and forth. It's all going to be a positive feedback, and it only ends when delivery is completed. This is where we get into the steps of uh, labor and birth. When we talk about partuition, that's the term for childbirth, the goal of labor. It's the forcible expulsion of the fetus followed by the placenta. Now, labor is divided into three stages, dilation stage, expulsion stage, placental stage. Let's talk about dilation first. The cervix is going to dilate. The fetus shifts to the cervical canal. Now, this is both due to gravity and uterine contractions. Now, this stage can last up to eight hours. Contractions last up to a half a minute and occur every 10 to 15 minutes. Usually what happens is as you get closer and closer to expulsion, uh, in this dilation st stage, the contractions are going to start and occur, let's say, every 30 minutes, every 25 minutes, every 20 minutes, every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes. At N, the amnion is going to rupture. This is where we get into the term having one's water break. Expulsion stage. This begins as the cervix is pushed open. That's when you have full dilation, 10 centimeters. So keep in mind that cervix is going to be dilating through this process. Um, so you have it, once you get to 10 centimeters, and the contractions are reaching their maximum uh, intensity, the expulsions will continue until fetus emerges from the vagina. This is where we get delivery. This is birth. Newborn infant arrives outside of the mother. So we can see this. Here we have this as being the dilation stage. Baby, uh, the developing fetus is oriented to a certain area. Here's the cervical canal. Here's this, you know, basically the cervical canals here. Here's the cervix. The pubic civis has been expanded a little bit. Then we move to the placental stage. Now, after birth, the muscle tension builds as the uterus is going to gradually decrease in size. And this is where you're going to have the afterbirth, which is referred to as the expelled placenta. Uterine contraction tears are, are basically going to tear the connection between the placenta and the uterine wall. As you keep having these contractions, you're going to start literally taking apart or tearing the placenta away from the wall. Now, here's the thing. How come I don't bleed intensely? Well, as the uterine contractions uh, occur, they're going to compress the uterine blood vessels. So therefore, they're going to restrict the blood loss. When we talk about premature labor, this occurs when true labor begins before the fetus has completed normal development. 
Let's talk briefly about this for a minute. Uh, premature delivery. This refers to birth at 28 to 36 weeks. The birth weight will be over 2.2 pounds. There's a high chance of survivability. Uh, you just have to watch the uh, newborn, uh, the preemie. Now, many fetuses die at 22 to 27 uh, weeks. This is premature birth, and this is due to the inability of the organ systems to function or high risk of developmental abnormalities. So basically, the chances of survival are directly related to the body weight at the time of delivery. Just to review, we had the dilation stage, so you can see this fully dilated the expulsion stage, and notice that there's the placenta, and we have a head delivery. Now, by the way, what's not mentioned is what happens if it's not? What happens if it's butt down and head is up? That's called a breach. Sometimes the doctors can manipulate the baby still inside. Sometimes they have to do a, what's called a cesarean, a cesarean section, where basically they have to open up the um, uterus, via a side incision and pull the baby out because otherwise it would not be able to get through. This happens particularly if one of the legs is out, but one of the legs is still back in there. It's a mess. And you want to minimize the stress on both uh, the uh, infant and the mother. Now, the placental stage, as you can see here, as you're reducing that, that uh, size of the uterus and you're having the contractions, you're going to have this eventually, the ejection of the placenta. Now, after delivery, development initially requires nourishment by maternal systems. Flat out, mom's the best means to provide nutrients. The initial newborn period, this lasts from post-birth to the first 28 days of life. So we would call it a newborn. Then we have to deal with the milk. Now, milk ejection, the milk letdown reflex, the milk is provided to infants. By the sixth month, uh, this is during pregnancy, the mammary glands are fully uh, developed and the gland cells will produce secretion known as colostrum. Now, this is very important. I mean... If the first few days when the newborn is, is uh, nursing from the mother, you're going to get a lot of what is known as colostrum. It's going to be rich with antibodies and other nutrients and immune factors. I provided you with a handout about that. It's extremely important. It helps reduce a lot of gastrointestinal distress. And it's in essence, mom providing sort of a, a temporary immune system for the developing infant until their uh, immune system is fully functional. It helps them to ward off infections. But what we have to do is talk about the milk letdown reflex. First, you have stimulation of the tactile receptors as the infant suckles the nipple. Neural impulses propagated to the spinal cord and then to the brain. The stimulations result in the stimulation of the secretory neurons of the paraventricular nucleus of the maternal hypothalamus. There, you're going to have oxytocin that's per, uh, released, but it's going to be released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland into the blood. The oxytocin reaches the mammary gland, and this results in contraction of the myoepithelial cells in the walls of the lactoferritus ducts and sinuses. This is the milk ejection, the milk letdown reflex, as you can see here. Stimulation of tactile receptors, neural impulses that eventually go through spinal cord, eventually up to the hypothalamus. Now remember that you have the paraventricular nuclei here, but their release occurs down here at the posterior lobe of the pituitary. This is going to release oxytocin, and this will then end with milk being ejected. Once we have um, the newborn, we go through postnatal delivery development, and that includes five primary stages. Neonatal development, birth to one month. Infancy, one month to one year of age. Childhood, one year to puberty. Puberty, though, depends on culture, diet, things like that. Roughly is between 10 to 15 years of age. 
adolescence. This is the onset of puberty until 18 years of age and maturity plus 18 years. Now, a variety of hormones are going to play a role in growth and development. Growth hormone, uh, thyroid hormone, adrenal steroids, as well as uh, the uh, reproductive steroids, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, things like that. Now, maturity will lead to eventually senescence. That's growing old, and the organ systems are aging. They won't function as well, as you can see here in the different groupings here. Neonatal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and maturity. Let me take a moment and bring up puberty. When it comes to the issues of male and female sex hormones, they have a differing effects on most body systems. Now, if you keep in mind that puberty, the hypothalamus is going to increase secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH. In response... The pituitary is going to release two different hormones, luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH. As a result, testicular and ovarian cells become sensitive to LH and FSH, and in response, you have the following. One, gamete production, sperm, ova. Two, secretion of sex hormones, uh, estrogen, testosterone, and subsequently also with the female, progesterone. Finally, you have acceleration of growth rate. This will end with the closure of the epiphyseal cartilages. If you remember the epiphyseal plates when they close, that's the end of growth of those bones. Now, I encourage you to take time to review the male and female responses to the steroidal hormones as you see in these diagrams here in the various structures, which we have somewhat covered in the preceding chapters and both in AMP1 and in AMP2. As you can see, all of these. Now, what we are going to do now is we're going to get into a little bit of genetics and inherit, inheritance. Okay? A person may be described in terms of genotype and phenotype. Now, we've got to get some terms clear here. When I talk about inheritance, otherwise known as heredity, this refers to the transfer of genetically determined characteristics from generation to generation. No problem. Genetics is the study of inheritable traits. When I talk about genotype, this is the genetic makeup. This is the material that is uh, all the genes that are on the chromosomes and the genetic components that make this up, make up your genetic, uh, your genotype. Phenotypes are a little different. Those are observable traits. The anatomical and physiological characteristics observed from the genotype, but remember something, keep this in mind. Not all genes, okay, or gene types, we will call later on alleles, are going to be observed because some genes have preference over, uh, some gene versions have preference over other versions. But we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. When I talk about a karyotype, that's the number and visual appearance of the chromosomes in the cell nuclei of an organism. Um, chromosomes, there are two basic types. There's autosomes and there's sex chromosomes. Now, autosomes, otherwise known as non-sex chromosomes, affect somatic characteristics, hair color, eye color, um, hair shape. Is it, you know, straight or is it kinked? Is it wavy, etc.? There are 22 pairs of chromosomes that are autosomes for humans. Sex chromosomes, these are the chromosomes that convey sexual differences or characteristics. Uh, all humans have one pair. Males will have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, which are completely different because they have different genes on each of the chromosomes. Females will have two X chromosomes. So to sit there and say we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, Yes, the first 22 are basically autosomes. They are involved with somatic or body structure characteristics, biochemistry, things like that. The last pair is what defines us whether we're male or female, and those are the sex chromosomes. Okay, now X chromosomes, you have to keep in mind, as I mentioned to you earlier, they're larger than Y, and therefore X and Y have different genes on each of the chromosomes. Now, 
I like how the author mentions this very briefly. Genotype is like your set of plans, but the phenotype is the detailed structure. Now you might say, well, why? Well, we're going to get into that because here are the 23 pairs and the first 22 control structure like blood type, hair color, um, muscle metabolism, and the biochemistry in the liver, all that stuff. But when we get to X and Y, look at the difference. Y is this teeny weeny little guy. X is this bigger one. For females, they would have two X's. Boom, boom. For a male, has X and a Y. They have very different genes on each one of them. Now, when we talk about genes and chromosomes that determine the patterns of inheritance, we have to understand certain terms. When I talk about homologous chromosomes, this would be an autosomal pair of chromosomes that have the same structure and carry genes that affect the same traits. So let me just make it simple. Let's go back a second here and go to chromosome number one. We all have two pairs of chromosome one. One of these chromosomes came from mom. One of them came from dad. They basically have, they code for, for genes on each of them that, that are basically the same genes, for them, but they may be versions where one is dominant and one is recessive. We don't know until you examine them. This is where I get into the part about the versions. A trait that can have different versions of the gene for that trait are called alleles. Now, to help you understand alleles, think about it this way. When we were talking about blood in an earlier chapter, we talked about individuals that could have both alleles that code for type A blood. Or you could have type A blood where one allele has type A, the other allele has type O. Type O is recessive. It's not seen unless both copies are present. So what happens is A is dominant. A is going to basically be the blood type that is going to be expressed. You may be genotypically, in other words, type A and type O, but phenotypically, all you're going to have is type A blood. Okay? When we talk about a locus, that's a gene's position on the chromosome. If two chromosomes of a homologous pair have the same allele for a particular gene, it's said to be homozygous. So, Let's go back to type A blood, for example. If I have both of my chromosomes that code for type A blood, I'm homozygous type A. If two chromosomes of homologous pair have different alleles for a particular gene, it's said to be heterozygous. So let's go back to that other uh, situation. If I have type A and then I have type O, type A will be expressed, type O you won't see, but I would be heterozygous type A because I have one allele for type A, one allele for type O. Different alleles can be expressed or observed. Here is an example of heterozygous, the same allele for the gene, and heterozygous, different alleles. I think they've got that a little messed up. Same allele for the gene is homozygous. Heterozygous is when you have different alleles for the gene. Now, on average, autosomal pairs of chromosomes contain about a thousand pairs of alleles. Okay? We go back here. When we talk about this little boy here, the smiling, happy person, we're going to get into recessive and dominant. Okay, let's take a look at this for a second. Different alleles can be expressed, that is, observed differently. If one allele is required to express, that is, observe the trait from a homologous pair of chromosomes, this allele is said to be dominant. Let's go back to our little boy there. If he has freckles, that is an example of strict dominance, requires only one copy, one copy of the allele for the trait to be expressed. Okay? If both homologous chromosomes have to have the same allele to express, that is, observe that trait, that allele is said to be recessive. For red hair, you need both alleles for the red hair to be present. 
and he does. Okay. Now, since sperm and egg contribute one copy of the chromosome, they contribute one copy of the allele for that gene. This can be determined by probability of the genotype by a Punnett square. Now, I want to warn you right now, what gets to be a big problem for some people is they don't understand that a Punnett square does not tell you this brother will have this blood type and this brother. They only tell you the probability of having a particular blood type, a particular uh, hair color, etc. Because each and every individual pregnancy, each and every individual newborn is separate from the prior pregnancies or from the future pregnancies. The future and the, and the, and the um, past do not influence the present situation. So a Punnett square is excellent to understand probability of a genetic outcome and thereby of not only the genotype, but the phenotype. But that's under the principles that you understand that this is probability. In other words, this is the chances that this could occur. This is the chances that that could occur. Also, you have to understand that many, many phenotype uh, characteristics are not simple. That is, one gene determines the trait. Rather, the trait can be determined by several genes. This is where we get into what's what we call polygenetic inheritance, polygenes, many genes, anything two or greater. That is the expression of a trait based on more than one gene, and the combination create a variety of phenotypes. As you see here, one's black, uh, dark haired, one's black haired, and one's brown haired. Okay? Now, let me just take this with a situation here. Remember that any egg or any sperm is going to have basically uh, the paternal alleles. Okay, so this dad was homozygous A. This mom was homozygous little a. They're different alleles of the same gene, different versions. All have normal skin pigmentation. Every, you have basically four for four, where they'll end up with a big A, which is the dominant, and a little a, which is the recessive. Okay. Now, let's say we have the paternal alleles and you have basically big A and small a. But, of course, the capital A, which is the dominant gene, is going to be observed. No problem. The only way that you're going to get the little a being, obser uh, being observed or expressed is when you have two copies of the little a. Everybody got that? Okay, fine. So. Dad, the paternal, is going to contribute either a big A or a small A. So you've got little a here, little a here. Dad, big A here, big A here. And, of course, mom is going to contribute little a, little a, and little a, and little a. So what does this mean? In this case, what we have here is normal pigmentation. They're going to be heterozygous, meaning that they're going to have two different alleles. One of them is going to be expressed. That's the dominant one, the capital A. The other situation here is you have 50% of the children, okay? So two out of four of the children are homozygous recessive and exhibit albinism. If you're not familiar with albinism, basically albinos. They have no pigmentation in the skin, none in the eye, and so they are much more sensitive to sunlight uh, UV radiation damage, okay? Anyways, moving on. Now, there are several different patterns of inheritance. We have autosomal inheritance. This can be simple or polygenic. Autosomal, they're all on the 22 pairs. Simple inheritance can be divided into strict dominance, incomplete dominance, or co-dominance. Let me help you there with a real quick example. Strict dominance, like I was showing you, whether you have one copy or you have both uh, copies of the alleles, that gene is going to be expressed. It's going to be observed. In complete dominance, this is where you get a blending effect. Uh, it's an interesting speculation. When the basics of genetics was developed by Gregor Mendel, okay, he used pea plants. 
and he used about nine different observable uh, traits from pea color to pea shape to flower color, etc. But one speculates instead, what if he had used snapdragons? Now, snapdragons are a pretty flower, and we're going to be having, you'll see them during the summertime. But an interesting thing that happens with snapdragons is this. They have one allele for white, they have one allele for red. But when you have heterozygous white and red, you have an incomplete dominance. And guess what you get for the flower? Pink. Incomplete dominance means that the two alleles merge the characteristics. Now, this is different from codominance. Codominance, and this is where you're going to see this, blood typing, ABO. Codominance is where both dominant traits can be expressed, where both uh, alleles that are dominant will be expressed equally. That's where you get, now A type is dominant, B type is dominant, O type is recessive. Now here's the kicker. If you have one allele for A and one allele for B, guess what? You get AB blood type. That's an example of codominance. Now, let's move from there to sex-linked inheritance. Remember we said there was one last pair that uh, has basically, um, if you're female, you're going to have two X chromosomes. If you're male, you're going to have XY. Now, what that means is if you have X-linked genes or a particular trait that's connected to that X, uh, you'll only find that on the X, and Y, you'll only find that on the Y. So Y-linked traits are only passed from father to son. When you see uh, sex chromosomes, this gets into other situations. Now, this is where we've talked about these different types. Let's get over to the the sex chromosomes part. Here's an X-linked allele. Notice that same allele is not going to be on the Y, so that means that whatever is on this X chromosome is going to be expressed in the male, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Whatever is on the Y will be expressed, okay? Now, let me get you into an example of something that's passed only from dad. Are you ready? Hairy ears. And I know you're sitting there going, did I hear him right? Yes. Hair that is uh, showing up around the ears, around the pinna, is passed from father to son. It's Y-linked trait. An X-linked trait is something that would come from mom and only from the one X that dad has. Now, you can deal, you can uh, work this out in a Punnett square. For, X, for sex link traits. I'm going to show you that in a second. One of the things you got to keep in mind is this. Now, if the sex link trait is recessive, that means you have to have both copies. What's going to happen is since, you, since the male only has one X, if the sex link trait is recessive or not, it doesn't matter. It's going to be showing up in the male. But in females, if the sex link trait is on the X and it is recessive, and mom has a normal X and another X that's recessive, she's going to be what is referred to as a carrier. She may not have any of the trait uh, phenotype, but she'll pass that on to her children. Now, what you see mathematically is in cases where you have uh, moms that are carriers, males will express the trait more often than they will have with only one X chromosome, which I've shown you. Let's take a look at colorblindness, okay? What happens on the X chromosome is you can have women that have normal vision but can be carriers of colorblindness. And there are various types of colorblindness. And this one, I believe they're going to use as an example, red-green. There is red-green colorblindness, red-blue colorblindness, and green-blue colorblindness, which is very rare. Now, a man that only has X chromosome, so whichever allele the chromosome carries will determine uh, that he has a normal color vision, okay? Now, here's the problem. If you have the color blindness gene on that X, 
in your sperm, you will either have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. In mom, she will have a normal color vision, which is in the capital C. The small c is the recessive allele, which carries the colorblindness gene. So how does this work out in a Punnett square? Well, you have this X small c. Daughter is a carrier. The son who gets the X from mom, the son is going to be colorblind because the son gets the Y chromosome from dad. Dad is going to contribute a Y. He'll end up with one normal son. So you have a one out of four chance of having a normal color vision son, uh, son or a 50-50, I should say, because you're going to have two, two girls, two boys, okay? And so the color blindness will show up in one child. Daughters will not have this. The only way that you could have a colorblind daughter is if A, dad's colorblind, and B, mom is either a carrier or herself is colorblind. Okay? So what you got is one colorblind uh, son, normal vision for, for one son, normal vision for daughter, normal vision for this daughter, but she's a carrier of the colorblindness gene. Okay. We're wrapping this up soon, but we want to talk about a few things. There are a lot of clinical disorders that are linked to individual chromosomes or their genes. Chromosomal abnormalities can involve many genes, and as a result, most are usually lethal. This is a sad uh, thing that does occur. Variations within an individual gene can exist, and these can be single base differences. They're referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Think about it this way. When we talked about uh, genes in AP1, and we talked about just individual mutation. What did we also say? Well, there are a bunch of codons that code for isoleucine or lysine or something else like that. So one difference in that codon, because a codon is three bases, may not lead to any differences in the, the amino acid that's expressed or eventually the gene product. Okay. So you can have single nucleotide polymorphisms that have no effect. You could have others that do have an effect. But here's also a big picture view. Too much or too little of the chromosome number can lead to genetic defects. In some cases, the individual will live, but it will have disabilities. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take an example. Trisomy 21, known as Down syndrome. You have three copies of the chromosome 21. Not two, three. This results in structural and intellectual disabilities. Okay. Uh, it used to be, without more advanced medicine, the individuals would live till about the age of 18, maybe 20, and maybe die of a stroke. Now they can live successful, somewhat full lives, depending on the severity. And they can go into their 40s, in some cases 50s. Uh, sometimes because of that extra chromosome 21, it may cause immune problems, which can lead to subsequent either autoimmune diseases or leukemia or something else like that. But the individuals can live. Okay? Now, Kleinfelder syndrome, you have an extra X chromosome. Now, phenotypically, they're male. So in other words, they have X second X, and then a Y. But because of this second X, the testes fail to mature. They are, in essence, sterile. Sometimes they will tend to grow breasts. The extra chromosome tends to lead to decreased testosterone production. Finally, we have Kleinfelder's, uh, excuse me, uh, Turner's syndrome. This is where you actually have what the person would refer to as XO. In other words, a female would normally have two Xs. They're missing one of the X chromosomes. They appear female, and also this chromosome deletion is referred to as monosomy. So what happens is that they look a little bit female, but they fail to develop at puberty. The ovaries are not functional, and the estrogen production is negligible. And you can see this. Here we have trisomy 21 with the... Um, they used to use the term, which I believe they take as more offensive now, mongoloid. 
Um, what basically it happens is that they had somewhat of a, um, from the mongoloid uh, people, this appearance of facial structure commonality, but that is not something where uh, it's used now. It's considered somewhat offensive. So one would refer to them as Down syndrome. As you can see here, you have one, two, three copies of chromosome 21. Over here, you have two X's and a Y. That's the Kleinfelder syndrome. And finally, you have here what looks like a female, but you have only one X and it's missing an X. Okay? Now, when we take a look at the human genome, and I know that some of you might be down to page 1067 and looking at that huge map and going, ah, I'm not asking you to memorize all of those genes. Okay? But just think about this. If you step back to 1985, it was a dream to have the human genetic map mapped out. Between 1987 and about 1999, they figured it was going to take 20 years. And they actually shorted because they knew as the techniques and technologies advanced, they would be able to do more work faster and have a better understanding as they were mapping it. But today we have the human genome, the full set of genetic material, the DNA in our chromosomes, basically understanding all the genes. Mapping of the traits has led to a variety of discoveries and led to new hope for disease treatments. We also find, interestingly enough, a concept called epigenetics, because not all the genes are controlled just by their DNA. There are means uh, where you don't remove the DNA, you don't cut the DNA, but there are, is, is really now a study of inherited traits that don't involve changing the DNA, but basically turning the DNA on or off. And this is usually by adding methyl or acetyl groups to um, the bases. So adenine, cytosine, guanine, th thymine, Pretty much usually either in the cytosines, uh, cytosines or um, I think the adenines. And basically, if you do this to DNA, it will alter the gene expression. And this is done rather than actually altering the actual DNA. So instead of the gene being read, it may be either turned on or turned off. Just to give you one uh, quick example. Uh, there is a genetic defect that occurs and the individuals have sort of an elfish face. And I think the other one is called Angelman syndrome. And they're basically gene defects uh, due to um, this epigenetic manipulation and really depends on whether the manipulation occurs on dad's chromosome of a particular gene or mom's chromosome of that same particular gene. So you have different phenotypes of this different uh, genetic disorder, and it just depends on whether it came from mom or dad, okay? So, again, you can see as we look at this map here, the chromosome pairs, what areas on these uh, chromosomes do you see a variety of these uh, diseases? Now, you need to be mindful of it. You'll see every once in a while that there'll be a little asterisk here, and it says one form of the disease. There may be multiple forms of disease, some of them on different genes or caused by outside influences that lead to subsequently a disease, okay? One of them may be genetic. Others may be caused by outside influences. Well, that pretty much wraps up our course and this chapter. I encourage you to peruse chapter uh, review outline on pages uh, 1069, 1072. Complete review questions you'll see on pages 1072, 1073. Complete the review sheets on 1060 and 1068. Also take time to review the handouts that I've included in the Blackboard on germ type layers as well as the nutrient uh, contributions of breast milk to the newborn. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.